Mark chapter 11, verse 1 through 11. And this morning's theme is Palm Sunday. Uh, we all know it as the triumphal entry into Jerusalem by our Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, but the lost basically kissed him goodbye. This is a week where he will be rejected where they will ridicule and they will mock him, he definitely will go through a week of passion, of suffering. I am amazed at the remarks of unbelievers towards Jesus Christ at times. If you listen to some of the secular news stations or radio programs, possibly even watch some of the television programs, you'll be amazed at what people say about Jesus, the mockery of it all. I remember years ago hearing a comedian mocking Jesus' second coming. It blew me away how, how bold, how arrogant, how prideful this man was as he mocked his coming. You may have known him. Um, I can't remember his name right now. It may come to me. I think it was Henry. But he screamed a lot in his comedy. He liked to scream. And he would talk about Jesus hasn't come yet. And he's screaming it. He's not here. He's not coming. Where is he? You know, and, and everyone's laughing at it. And it turned out that he was actually a PK, a preacher's kid. Kind of sad when you see a preacher's kid rebel against God so badly. And he ended up uh, passing away too in an accident. So it, it's amazing that you hear some of the remarks of the world. Yet I can remember my own attitude towards Jesus. I, I really didn't seek God didn't want God. I just wanted to live my own life. I wanted to be my own God, right? And that's really what it's all about. What do I want to do? How do I want to live? How do I want to enjoy life? And so I did it my way, as Frank Sinatra would say. We did it our way. <clears throat> Living without God, an attitude that was negative against God. In fact, I was an enemy of God, and yet God still saved, sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for me. That blows me away that you could be an enemy of God, and yet he still loves you. That truly is grace, isn't it? That is grace, that even while you're against him, that soldier that stabbed him in the side, that soldier that forced him to pick up that cross and continue to move on, that person that mocked him and ridiculed him, he died for them. He died for them, and we shouldn't forget that. He died for your enemies, for those that are uh, coming against you for those that mock you for your faith. He died for them. And it's hard for us to understand because he died for us also. So Jesus is entering Jerusalem. And this is really the beginning to his end, right? On this earthly life. Here, as we will see next week, Friday in five days, that he will be crucified. Then he will be buried. And then on Sunday, he will resurrect from the dead. Sunday is is welcomed in he is welcomed into jerusalem and by monday he will enter into the lion's den he will have a week literally of hell literally as he goes through so many emotional stresses so many attacks jesus i'm sure did not look forward to the last week of his struggles he was fully man we have to understand that completely and, and i'm sure that it hurt him to see his own people come against him plot against him to take him and ridicule him but yet he endured it he made the choice to go through it because he loved the world that he gave his only begotten life for us but i'm sure that he will rejoice at the end when he is resurrected from the dead and all sin is paid for and now man can come by faith through jesus christ to god let's look at the context here a little bit just so we get an idea of what's happening here jesus is talking to his disciples about what's going to take place uh, in the kingdom of God, he, he came not to serve, I'm sorry, not to be served, but he came to serve and to be a ransom for many. Then he served blind Bartholomew, we saw earlier, in giving him his sight. In fact, in chapters 1 through 10, we see Jesus as a servant living his life in service to those around him. Jesus was always that example of being a servant. He always served his disciples. He served those who were around him. Whether they needed to be healed or whether they needed to be fed, he was a servant completely. Chapter 11 begins the second section of Mark's gospel where we see the servant Jesus giving his life as a sacrifice. And that is the ultimate service, is to sacrifice your life. 
Passion Week starts on Sunday, the 10th of Nisan, the Jewish calendar, and will end the earthly life of Jesus on Nisan 14, the Passover. Now, after taking a deep breath, Jesus is ready uh, to enter into Jerusalem. Let's read the text this morning so we understand the context here in chapter 11. It says, Now, when they came near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent out two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside the street, and they loosed it. And some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing loosing the colt? So they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, and they let him go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their garments on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees, spread them on the road, Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, quoting from Psalms, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve so we get the context there of what jesus is doing as he enters into jerusalem and who he encounters and how they receive him a reception uh, as a king who sits on a donkey being received into jerusalem and as he enters into jerusalem he looks around at, at what is going on in his father's house and he's so upset with it that he ends up leaving the house and withdraws Now, as Jesus draws near to the east side of Jerusalem, if you were to look at a map, you would see Israel and you would see the old city Jerusalem today and the Mount of Olives on the east side. This is where Jesus is coming from. And then he would enter in through those gates there. And he's coming from Bethphage or Bethany where he stops on that Mount of Olives. And that Mount of Olives, he oversees everything. He, he can see Jerusalem, he can see, today he would see the Dome of the Rock, he would see that gate boarded up, but at that time he would see Jerusalem, the temple, and all the people coming in, uh, preparing for the Passover that would take place in a few days. The elevation is about 2,600 uh, feet in the air from the Mount of Olives, and you can have a pretty good panoramic view of everything around you. From there you can see where, where Abraham walked up to offer up his son Isaac as a sacrifice unto God and obedience and worship. You could see the city of David uh, where he built that city right next to the temple where he could hear the music of the priests and the different divisions that would take turns within the 24 hours of playing worship and praise to their God. And and David would find comfort and, and peace there as he slept in the middle of the night there. You could oversee uh, the... the, the um, Gehenna in the valley that uh, the fire and the waste that was burning and not quenched where the worm does not die and you could oversee the whole city that David had built there in that area uh, the Solomon's temple it was it, it's a beautiful sight and today is just as beautiful as it was then the future will unfold the second coming of Christ right at that point too so it is an, a, a pivotal point it is a point that, that you can see all things and what God will do in the future You will see God come at the end of time and he will enter in through those gates. Jesus will. The gates that he entered in into Jerusalem here on the triumphal entry. It's interesting that Ezekiel speaks about that in Ezekiel 44 1. It says, Then he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces towards the east, but it was shut. And today that gate is shut. Take some Google pictures and and look at them, and you'll see that gate is gated up. And in fact, uh, there are some Muslims and and those that are against Christ who have planted a graveyard right in front of that gate, uh, thinking that 
a Jew would not come to that area because there's dead bodies and on a Sabbath day they would defile themselves being next to a dead body and so forth and so they put this graveyard in front of the gate and they shut it up and it's boarded up and walled up and so forth but unfortunately they don't understand that when Jesus Christ comes back again all bodies will be resurrected from the dead hallelujah huh God has everything in, in plan so now we see Jesus sent two unknown disciples into the village so when the two unknown disciples enter this village, they would see this coat tied up. Uh, a coat that has never been ridden before. A coat that has been prepared specifically for Jesus. In the Old Testament, when an animal was set apart for God's use, it had to be one year old and had not been used for normal life. And so this coat was set apart for Jesus' use, uh, specifically to fulfill the plan of God that Jesus would sit upon this and ride into Jerusalem. You know, God sanctifies us and sets us apart. Uh, at one time, we were enemies against him, and yet he loved us and poured into us. And then he set us apart for a work for him. Every one of us have a work. You have a purpose in life. You weren't created without a purpose in life. And that purpose is, is to be fulfilled with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. He hasn't called you just to live life. He's called you to experience life with Him in this life with a plan and a purpose. You may not think you have a plan. You may not think you have a purpose, but God has a spiritual purpose for you within the kingdom of God. And you have to seek that out. You have to pray about that plan. You have to ask God to fulfill that plan. And believe me, he will do that when you seek it with your whole heart. So they untie this untamed coat and they bring it to Jesus just as he had said. And if anyone stopped and asked you why are you doing this, just say the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it. And the Lord does. He has need of you. He definitely does. He loves using people. Uh, he told his disciples, I have to go away. And when I go away, I will fill you with the Holy Spirit and I'll have need of you. You will be needed to spread the gospel, not just to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, but to the outer parts of the world. And today, how much more this world needs Jesus, right? Look at what's going on in the world today and it definitely needs Jesus. Look at our presidency and the mockery that's happening there. They need Jesus. We have two guys up there that are close. Uh, you know, I don't know them personally. They've been endorsed by uh, Greg Laurie, endorsed Rubio. Uh, Jack Hibb has endorsed uh, Cruz, you know. So these two men who, who supposedly, you know, these two pastors and I trust them and, you know, um, believe what they're saying that these men are, are godly men they love jesus and so forth so these are the guys that possibly we should be looking at well obviously rubio we can't because he stepped down i don't know if you heard his step down address there but wow it was pretty awesome uh, as he stepped down and he just made it very clear look jesus is in control of my life he said, and if Jesus wanted me to be president, I would be president. But obviously, he doesn't want me to be president now. And I want what he wants. And so at this time, I'm stepping down to fulfill his plan. And I thought, wow, I would have voted for you, just, you know, if you would have said that earlier, you know. I mean, what, what a heart. What a, what a view. Now, you get someone like Trump, and you just go, where is this guy coming from? Where is he coming from? You know, and we all have our different views, but boy... Uh, I think he's the ultimate politician. And he's so great at it that everyone thinks he's not a politician. That's how great he's at, at it. So it's just pretty amazing. These people need Jesus, and, and we need to give them Jesus. You know, I understand that we may, we may need to be ready for what is ahead of us, but we need to also realize that we have a call to spread the gospel. Yes, even to his enemies, even to his enemies. So Jesus is uh, numbering each step of the disciples here. He has a plan and a purpose for them. I love what John Corson said. Why should I bother to pray or to study the word, to worship or to fellowship with other believers? Why, why, why? I know people like that. I don't have to go to church. Why should I go to church? Why should I pray? Why should I fellowship with people? It doesn't really matter. Well, it does matter. Boy, it's something that God has commanded us to do to equip for the work of the ministry. In God's economy, his blessings and moving in this world depends on our participation. That's been my word all week. The Lord's been bringing that word up all week. Participation. 
We need to participate in the kingdom of God. We need to get involved. We need to do something for him. He did his all for us. So why can't we do something for him? I wonder if one of the mind-blowing moments in heaven might be when we see what we could have done, what might have happened if we would have taken it seriously and shared the gospel with some relatives, if we would have participated what God could have done, what God would have done if we would have stepped up to the plate and moved forward with him. You know, your steps are numbered by the Lord. The proverb says, a man's heart plans his way. You know what he's saying there? And Solomon is saying there, basically, a man acts like God. He acts like God and he plans his own way. As though he has some choice. And as though he has some great wisdom. As though his plans are superior and above all other plans. You know, that's how man plans their ways. I'm going to do this this year and I'm going to do that. I'm going to buy and sell over here and I'm going to make money over here. You know, fool. Your souls require of you today. We don't plan our ways. We're not God. We don't see the future. We don't know what will happen tomorrow. We just don't. Stephen, and I mentioned to uh, last week or the week before, he's driving down the road. He didn't plan on getting an accident. He's on his bike. He's coming this way, just as he does other days, and a car hits him just like that. Just like that. Thank God he spared his life. But you never know. See, the proverb says a man plans his way. He thinks he's gone. He's going to make his steps and number, but it's the Lord who directs his steps. You make your plans, but it's the Lord who moves you. He changes things. He moves obstacles in and out of place just to direct you in the right place where you should be. Most of you were directed here to this church by the Lord because he wants you here. He loves this community. He loves Harupa Valley. And he wants to reach it with the gospel message. And he has put you here, moving you through friends and obstacles and places to get involved and to participate. Proverbs 20, 24 says, A man's steps are of the Lord's. How then can a man understand his own way? There's some truth there. I, I hear people all the time, well, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. I really don't. I, I shared that story with you a while ago. Uh, Zacharias, who's the scholar, shared it. And he shared a story about <clears throat> a farmer and, and a boy opened up the gate where the horse's corral was at, let the horse out. The neighbor comes over and says, it's too bad your boy opened up that gate and let the horse out. And the farmer goes, what do I know? You know, I don't know anything. He let the horse out. Next day, the horse comes back, and he's got like 25 horses that are following him. Opens up the gate, brings all the horses into the, into the stall. Neighbor next door comes and says, wow, it's a great thing. Your boy let that horse out. Look, at you got so many other horses. And the farmer looks and says, what do I know? What do I know? You know? Well, there was a war going on, and so they were recruiting young men to fight in this war. Well, the boy's trying to break some of these horses, and he breaks his leg. The neighbor comes over and says, it's a bad thing that your boy broke, broke his leg. He goes, what do I know? <laughs> you know? What do I know? They come to recruit to his house and say, oh, he broke his leg. We can't use him right now. The neighbor says, well, good thing he broke his leg, wasn't it? <laughs> says, yeah, what do I know? You know, what do I know? What do we really know, guys? What, what is going to go on tomorrow? Do you know what's going on tomorrow? Yeah, I'm going to wake up in the morning. I have this all planned. How do you know that? No man knows their plan. We really don't know. We have to what then? As Proverbs 3, 5 tells us, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not to our own understanding. Understanding in the Hebrew is talking about logic, planning, manip manipulating and maneuvering. That's what it's talking about. You, you trust in all of that. Lean not to your own understanding. And the Lord does something different. It's a matter of submitting and surrendering to Jesus Christ and he'll direct your path now look at verses four through six of the disciples find the quote so they went their way verse four found the coat tied by the door outside of the street and they loosed it but some of those who stood there said to them what are you doing loosing the coat and they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded so they let him go so just as Jesus said uh, I can keep Jesus's word if Jesus says something in the word of God I can believe it, and I know it will come true. 
because he is that honest, that sincere, and he has a purpose and a plan. So if God has promised you something, believe it. It may not happen today or tomorrow or next year, but believe it when he says something. And so just as he said. And then they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their clothes on it and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now this is a beautiful sight here. As Jesus gets on the coat, they bring it to Jesus and they start throwing their clothes on there. They start bringing branches, they, just like a king. And they're treating him like a king. Unfortunately, he's on an untamed coat and not on a stallion and a horse like a true king would probably be. But he's coming in peace into Jerusalem. We have to remember that. He's still coming in peace. Nothing's changed. He's not a warrior right now. He will be when he comes a second time. But right now, he's a king of peace. And he's bringing peace to men. He's trying to take their burdens and their worries and their cares into his bosom, into his hands, and give them rest, give them peace. And he's still doing that today. So many others joined in on this great celebration by laying everything that they had before Jesus. You know, it's interesting. There was a tradition in Rome when a general was victorious in a great battle. He would march into the city on his stallion. If you can picture this general with all of his, his uh, battle uh, awards and his robes and his swords and his spears and so forth, and he rides in proud, mighty, showing his strength and power to the nation. See, Jesus is that king, just like that Roman who rode into Jerusalem, but he rode in peace. He rode in power, under control, in meekness. That's what meekness means, under control. He had all the power of all the angels and legions that have ever been created. He was God himself who created the heavens and the earth, and he comes with all his power, but not in pride, not in power, not in strength, but in meekness. He rides into Jerusalem. Pretty awesome. That general would have all of the conquered nations riding right behind him in submission to him in humility in pain and suffering he dragged them in with the chains with the shackles showing off his great victories to those in rome you know that jesus told peter you remember when peter said something that was not scriptural not biblical in fact was underlined by the enemy himself said get thee behind me satan and jesus said look the the gates of hell shall not prevail against me upon this rock and he's talking about himself not peter i shall build my kingdom and jesus has his enemy right behind him our enemy right behind him he is in shackles he is in chain and only when God says he can move or turn or do this under his control, he does it. And so Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is in total control, not Satan. Satan's only on a leash and he only lets him out so far in order to fulfill God's plan. And so he stands right behind him. And then that general with all his enemies right behind him in shackles and so forth, he would have his army. And his army would be behind him kind of enclosing the enemy there, but with their spears and their robes as they all march in together in this great victory. And see, behind Jesus, behind Satan, we stand always behind him. He is our leader. In fact, the second coming of Christ, when he comes on his horse, he'll be leading us on the white horse, and we'll be following him to fight this great battle. But he does all the fighting, just speaking through the sword of his mouth. We're his disciples, and we follow him. We always follow him, not even putting the enemy behind us because we can't put the enemy behind us. We have to put the enemy before us and Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. And so we are behind trusting and taking his lead and humbly coming in with Jesus into the kingdom of God. That's how that picture is portrayed here with that tradition of the Roman soldier riding into Jerusalem, and yet we see Jesus here on a a donkey, followed by 12 pathetic disciples. 
and the majority of them smelling like fish. (laughs) These are the people that God uses. Yet Jesus warranted definitely a triumphal entry for he is God in the flesh. He conquered uh, the world of its sins and truly he will one day again enter into Jerusalem in triumph. This was a fulfillment of the Old Testament in Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a coat of a donkey. Now, notice that he said just and having salvation, for that is exactly who Jesus was. He was just, and he was bringing salvation to a lost world. So Jesus came into Jerusalem as prophesied in a way in which no one, no one could have an excuse of not knowing who he said he was. He had visited that city, fulfilling that scripture exactly like Daniel the prophet said in his word. Exactly 1,773 and 88 days after the commence and the rebuilding of Jerusalem by Nehemiah. You remember the story of Nehemiah? Go and read it. Small little book. Give you an idea of him rebuilding that temple, having a heart for the temple, having a heart for his people, wanting to see a a work done. And from that day forward, God began to number the days when Jesus would enter into Jerusalem, which would be March 14th, uh, 44-45 BC when they commenced that building. And then on April 6th, 32 AD, Jesus enters into Jerusalem on a donkey, exactly as prophesied. And they sang, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. What a glorious time that must have been for all of those people watching Jesus. Now, what was on their mind, we really don't know. Were some of them understanding the implications of what Jesus was really doing there? Did they understand he came to bring peace, peace with God? eternal salvation or were they thinking of glorious victory over their enemies Rome and anyone else that would come against the nation Israel could be both I think both probably did take place some who understood and turned their hearts over to Jesus and others who did not understand because as he enters into Jerusalem into the city walls and he sees all the money changers he doesn't kick them out by the way He turns tables over. He's very upset, but then he just leaves. He still loves them. He still loves them, and he doesn't pull them out of the temple. He allows them to stay in there. Hopefully their eyes would be open. You know, this crowd was moved by emotion or truth, one or the other. We're to be moved by truth and not emotional-ism, emotional-ism. Emotion, true emotions differ from emotionalism. You can have emotions, but then you can have emotionalism, which are two different things. Emotionalism governs your life. Emotions comes with truth. Having emotions is a scriptural thing. and It's very active in a believer's life. <clears throat> when <clears throat> emotions are moved, to emotionalism, we find a fine line between truth and dangerous errors. We really do. And it is that fine line. And it's a line that sometimes we don't see and we cross over and we begin to sin because of this emotionalism. When we're dependent on on our feelings in our hearts rather than simply teaching of God's word because emotions are governed by his word. We, we kind of corral them in according to the word of God. We put our feelings of emotionalism before God, scripture, and we make sure that they're scriptural. <coughs> Yet, we do have necessary emotions, like love. That's an emotion. God loved us. <clears throat> That's what we call a communicable emotion from God. He has given us that ability to love, to love someone. And you know what that emotion feels like when you fall in love with somebody. The whole emotional thing, you know, the the lack of eating because you just like, I'm just thinking of this person all the time. You know, the the scent, you know, that just, oh, it just brings memories and that love. 
the love for a child. <clears throat> Boy, what a mother would do to protect their children. How she would put them in a bubble along with themselves and everybody else could become an enemy because she loves that child so deeply, so emotionally. But that can even become emotionalism because putting her in that bubble and then ostracizing everybody else and ridiculing and mocking and anger, it becomes sin. So it becomes sin. What about hope? Hope is a wonderful emotion. When we're hoping that God will deliver us. When we're hoping that God will move in our life. When we're hoping for somehow he meets that financial need. Lord, please, Lord, please. And you're, you know, you're feeling that the stress and all of that. <clears throat> but that hope can turn into emotionalism when you start claiming it and naming it and blabbing it and grabbing it. You know, And now you're like forcing it. And that's not what God intends. Because hope has trust in it. What about joy? Now there's joy it is different than being happy. Because happy, <clears throat> happy, any of us can be happy. You can be happy right now and you can leave these doors and be very unhappy. You know, if I all of a sudden got my checkbook out and I said, oh, what's your name? Let me write it out there. Here's a $1,000 and I'm saying, here, here you go. You're like, a thousand dollars? Are you kidding me? And you're, you're the most happiest person in the world at that moment. You know, I mean, you're jumping up and down and you're kind of like, I got to go because you can go over to the bank real quick and, you know, cash that check. And you got already ideas of what you're going to do with that, you know, tax uh, rebate, you know, and so forth. And so you're ready to go. Except when you get to the bank and you realize that I don't have the funds to cover a thousand dollars. All of a sudden you become unhappy right away. It bounced. What do you mean it bounced? What do you, why would he give me a check that there's no money? In, you know, see, ha that's happy. But joy, joy, happiness, by the way, is emotionalism. Joy is inward peace that comes with God. When we experience the joy of God, that he's there, he'll never leave me nor forsake me. He's always by my side. And I have this joy in my heart. Even in the midst of struggles and pains and suffering, even if that check bounced, wow, okay, the guy's having some hard times. Worse than me. Praise the Lord. Okay, God, you're going to take care of it. There's joy there. Sorrow. Sorrow is another emotion. But we can take sorrow too, too far. Even hate, right? You know, we, we can hate. We can love things less. I can hate sin. I can hate the attitudes of people. I can hate what they do to the body of Christ. I can hate those things, but I'm to love them. That's a fine line. How do you do that? That's the Spirit of God who somehow gets you through that. And, and sometimes it's trial and errors at times where you try and you work on it, you work on it, work on it. It's a lifetime situation where you're always trying to work on it because you can hate all of a sudden the person and not the sin. We're to love the person and not hate them. In fact, we're actually to somehow encourage them and strengthen them and hopefully build them up if we can. But hate or even fear now if a lion comes in here i guarantee you as he walks into the doors all of you would jump up and start running you know find a way out because this lion comes in here with roaring loud noise and teeth growling and this huge mane you know that you're like what is going on here and you'll be running that's fear and that's good fear you wouldn't want to just stand there oh look at beautiful little lion you know fear has its purpose but fear of things can become sin when we're not trusting in God when God is in control <clears throat> fear moves us in all kinds of delusional ways and it becomes sin to us and hurts the body of Christ and even hurts ourselves the goal is to have emotions that lead to good fruits which is scriptural and proper Galatians talks about those good fruits Paul talks about in Corinthians chapter 13 what love is and so forth let your heart be moved by the word of God but not by emotionalism. Then in verse 9 through 10, we see this prophetic declaration. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now they just emphatically screaming this. You don't want me to scream it, but they were screaming this. This is a crowd. 
and together in unison it must have been a, a great great chorus as they begin to scream this out before jesus christ focusing on david who sat on the throne and his ancestor jesus who'd come and sit on the throne as david said that he would kneel before his king those who walk before and behind would cry out this prophetic truth we find it in psalms uh 118 113 uh, through 118 and it's repeated over and over by priests uh, as they celebrate the Passover season. The word Hosanna um, and blessed is used twice here. Hosanna means save now, and Jesus is always, always ready to save, uh, looking for opportunities to save. It's a messianic psalm. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the anointed one of Israel. And multitudes were hoping possibly for the restoration of Israel. They were acknowledging Jesus as the prophesied Messiah, the king, the one who would bring in the kingdom promised by the son of David. But Jesus would restore the kingdom of David um, by saving those spiritually. And so then he enters into Jerusalem, verse 11. He went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things as the hour was already late he went out to bethany with the 12 now he doesn't mention the money changers here he doesn't mention what was going on with the uh offerings of the lambs and what the priests were doing to make money off of those lambs by claiming that they were blemished and so he doesn't mention that mark doesn't mention that because mark is dealing with jesus as a servant as a man and so jesus comes in and he just does this he looks around he just looks around that's what Jesus does. He walks into his father's house, his father's house, into the center court there where there was all kinds of people, tables set up, money changers, animals, uh, all over the place, and he just stands there and he looks around. He looks around and he watches. And Mark says that he took off. The other gospel said he was enraged. And he went over to the money changers and he grabbed the tables and he began to toss them and throw them that's divine hatred godly hate righteous indignation revelation talks about the lamb of god and his wrath to come and that was an example of the wrath of the lamb <clears throat> but he looks around he looks at the money changers he looks at those people who are in the financial institutions those people that are bankers those people who loan money he looks at the retailers, those who are making money, those who are making money exchanges and so forth. He looks at the farmer, and he's looking at the farmers and how they're exchanging their lambs for other lambs and how they're manipulating and twisting and trying to make money there. He's looking at the religious leaders. He's looking at everybody, at everybody. As the religious leaders are standing there with their robes and their arms crossed and making sure everything is done properly, and Jesus just watches. You know, Jesus watches. He's a patient man. Our God is patient with us, isn't he? I know he is with me. There are times where I just wonder, why are you so patient with me? Because I love you. He loves you. And, and he sees what you don't see. He sees that you've been called before the foundations of the world. And if you've been called before the foundations of the world, then you've been called to do something. And you just haven't done it yet. And so he's patient with you until you're ready to do it. But he watches. And he sees. He, he sees behind closed doors, by the way. He sees what happens in your house and in your room and in the closet. He sees all those things. He's God. There's no place that you can hide from him that he does not see. Hey, you can go and, and rent yourself a submarine and go to the deepest parts of the ocean. And he's right there. Get it to NASA, become an astronaut, and fly to the farthest places. The Bible says God has the universe in the span of his hand. That's everything. He sees all things. He sees all things. Yes, bad. He sees it all. But somehow he overlooks it through grace. Uh, somehow he understands that man is frail and weak. And how... He looks at it is through the lens of Jesus, that Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. 
And somehow his blood kind of washes that away. And so what God sees is he sees the potential in your life. He sees what he can do with you if you step up to the plate and begin to participate. He sees the possibilities. He sees that you think that you don't have any gifts. You think that you're incapable of doing. You think that you can't measure up. He sees all that, but that's all been covered by Jesus' blood and his work on the cross. All he's willing to do is to say, take a step of faith and I will equip you for that work. I will equip you. I'm not equipped to teach the word of God. This is far from whatever I, I would ever have thought to do. And I do it out of obedience to him because this is what he's called me to do. We went to a men's breakfast last week. And I didn't know I was going to do this, but a uh, pastor asked me to open up in prayer. And immediately I'm like, started shaking, like, oh, no. Why didn't you give me some time? I could have prepared, you know. I could have prayed about it. I could have wrote something down. I could have thought of a funny joke. You know, just all these thoughts instantly just, I'm, Lord, why did you, Lord, why are you putting me in this spot? I don't want to do this, Lord. But I did it out of obedience, didn't want to do it. Got up there a little bit shaky and said, hi, guys. <laughs> you know, bet you're all hungry, right? Because I can see some of you are grumpy. <laughs> all right, we get grumpy when we get hungry. Why would I say that? I have no idea. You know, what a dumb thing to say. You know, then I just prayed for the, for the breakfast. <laughs> None of us are equipped to do what we do. Uh, most people in this ministry, what they do and what they're doing, they're doing for the first time. Like, oh, I've never done this before. That's okay. Just do it. <laughs> you know, God will give you what you need. It's amazing. Uh, God is looking not at the ability, but the uh, availability to just do something. And nothing that you do is little, small, insignificant, because it's all intertied with the kingdom of God. So even if you give the least of my brethren a cup of water, you've done it unto me, Jesus said. So whatever you do, you do it unto the Lord. He wants to use you. He wants participation because he loves you. And so he looks and he sees. He sees what you do in this life. He understands. He knows. And he wants to use you.